Hello there and welcome back to another episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter. I'm Rafael Di Furia, back at it again for another Friday night for another episode to talk about life abroad, living abroad, and everything else in between. All the little funny bits that go in there. This episode, like the title says, I wanted to talk about what not to do in Portugal. Whether you're traveling here or you're going to be living here, or going to become an expat in Portugal. There are some things that I would say might be worth avoiding. Probably at another point in the future, I'll do a follow-up to this. But these are some basic things that I think are definitely worthwhile to keep in mind while you are here in this beautiful country. But just before we get into the rest of this episode, a huge thank you to those of you who helped to make these episodes possible on a monthly basis through Patreon or through the one-time donations through the thanks button here on YouTube as well as rafaeldifuria.com slash support. Thank you all so very, very much for being a part of this. It is all very greatly appreciated. As well as a huge thank you to those of you who are subscribed, hit the like button, and share these episodes with your friends and family. But I will say that I do think it is about time we get started with this list, and in no particular order, here we go. Let's roll that intro. So the first thing that I want to get into in this episode is about how when people come to Portugal, there are certain assumptions that are made, and some people don't realize the unique culture and language that this country happens to have. So when you come to Portugal, I definitely advise you not to speak Spanish, not to just start speaking to people in Spanish, because shockingly, Portugal has its own language, and it's called Portuguese. It's quite different from Spanish. Yes, there are a lot of similarities between Portuguese and Spanish and even Italian. Latin romance languages, there are all these little bits and pieces that are similar, but they're not the same. But of course, it depends on how you approach the situation. Like if you say, excuse me, do you speak Spanish rather than just blurting it out? That's a, a completely different interaction there. So you do have to keep that in mind that like just don't assume when you go to another country that they're going to speak X, Y or Z language. So even if you speak English, don't just start speaking English. Maybe you could say, like, do you speak English? And that's a that's OK. You could ask in Portuguese to me is the most polite way to ask fala inglês or fala espanhol, then you at least have kind of a, a little bit of an in, but from there, of course, the answer can always be no. So anyway, I would say don't just assume that Portugal and Spain are the same thing, the same place with the same people. Try to avoid that and try to avoid speaking Spanish when possible. If, for example, you need a filler word from time to time, you will find that there are some Portuguese people who do speak the language but you also may find even if a person doesn't speak Spanish, they'll at least be able to understand some bits and pieces of it. So definitely avoid when possible. But it's funny, I'm just realizing as I'm recording this that it's somehow whenever I make these kind of lists of things to do, not to do, what's good, whatever it may be in these episodes, these list episodes, that I always end up talking about either language or food right at the beginning. So you know what? Let's keep with that tradition. And talk about something that's not necessarily about food, but food adjacent. And that in this case would be regarding alcohol. The country that you come from versus the country that you may be going to could have some different drinking culture. The way that people go about their evening out or that they start drinking Northern Europe versus Southern Europe and even different parts of Southern Europe. But when you come to Portugal, something very important to keep in mind is that there's not really this culture of overdrinking, drinking in excess, in my opinion. Of course, this is very much a generalization, but there does seem to be a lot of moderation in drinking. It's not that people don't drink. People do drink here and they enjoy it. But it's kind of to get you to that point of enjoying the evening to enhance the moment, so to speak. Enhance is such a strange word when you're talking about an intoxicant, at least in my opinion. <laughs> I have nothing against alcohol. I just think it's a strange way to put it. What I would say is if you come from a culture that may have more of a heavy drinking, binge drinking, like culture that you drink to get drunk, you drink to party, you drink to go out and really just go crazy, you may want to tone things down a bit. I have seen a lot of expats, especially from certain countries. 
I really am thinking about one place in particular. I'm not going to go say it in this episode. And they have given other people a bad name because of the association that people only will go there to drink and party and do drugs and this and that and the other. It's really unfortunate that there are so many people that come just as a holiday destination and end up really abusing the place. I hate to put it even into those terms, but really there's not much better of a way to say it that there is a that there are a lot of tourists that do come and expats as well that abuse the place they mistreat it they they throw things they break glass it's really it's really disgusting in my opinion i mean even i recently saw a video i believe i may have mentioned this in a recent episode as well or at least sometime within the past 6 months i saw a video of a tourist who was completely out of his mind jump into a Portuguese trash can. And when we're talking about trash cans in Portugal, it's not what you think of, like, say, a dumpster that's above ground that you could potentially jump out of. The trash cans here, the dumpsters here are actually semi underground. You do have part of it that comes above the ground, like a tube that has a lid that you can lift up. And anyway, this guy jumped into it and it can actually be a bit dangerous because there are these bags, these like these not burlap, but like a material on the bottom. So it could be difficult to try to get footing to try and climb out. And so all the people who weren't just tourists during this video were just laughing, thinking it was funny. Oh, this guy's drunk. He's out of it. He's this is that. But the Portuguese were like, hey, this is not cool. Like also, if the police come you're probably going to get a, in a bit of trouble for this. And there are those people that come and mistreat the local population. And it's not something that's necessarily unique to this country. It does happen in other parts of the world. But when you come, be respectful. That is just the top thing. But what I will say is that if you are going to be enjoying alcoholic beverages in this country, definitely, definitely try Vinho Verde, green wine. Yes, I did say green wine. It is a thing here in Portugal and definitely worth trying. And you don't have to have an expensive bottle to be able to enjoy it. Some of the mid-tier slash cheap bottles are actually, I would say, some of the more fun ones, especially with dinner, with a meal. And there are places where you can go to get very, very cheap glasses of wine in this country, even cheaper than Italy. I was very shocked to find out. This next point that I want to get into is... Something that I've definitely talked about recently and in the past that I do want to revisit because it is so important and it is so frustrating when I see people falling into this and actually creating a situation where the problem becomes worse because they fall into this, because they allow these things to happen. And that is falling into tourist traps and falling for the expat tax. At least that's what I call it the expat tax anytime when a service or a product has an additional amount added to it because the the person may not think that you know what the going rate is and somewhat to an extent that would go for also tourist traps that you're paying more than what you should but i will say for some tourist traps they can be worthwhile just for fun just a, a one-time experience just to have not always the worst thing but it's a shame to fall into some of these because say for example here in portugal maybe you could go have a really nice meal, everything included for lunch for eight euros. And then around the corner on maybe a little bit more of a main street, you pay for something that's like even worse quality with just the main entree itself. Not even like how the other one included like the um, lunch special, like with your appetizer and your meal, you would pay maybe double the price. So let's say 16 for just the entree itself. It's really unfortunate to see that. And even there's something that you do have to be careful of in Portugal from time to time. And that is when plates are just being brought out to your table. Like, oh, would you like this? Oh, would you like that? And sometimes people will fall for that thinking that things are included, but it's really everything's being added up. And so even I'll tell you like the, the grill house that I went to in a previous episode, I'll put that up in the corner here on YouTube if you're watching. It's an episode that I did on YouTube showing a little bit more out and about here in Braga. And I went to a grill house, a little bit more of a central area, and it did cost a little bit more. That's partially because of the location, and that's partially because of the location within the location. Things in Braga do cost a little bit more than some other parts of the country. What I would pay maybe 12 or 14 euros for, you could go to other parts of the country 
in maybe smaller villages and start paying like eight to 10. It really just depends on what you're eating and where you're going. So that one place that's by the main cathedral here, that grill house, I would say, yeah, it's worth going to. Maybe there are other places where you could get a chicken dish that actually would be better and maybe a little bit less or kind of similar pricing here in Braga also. But it's very important to keep these things in mind that maybe you will have to pay a little bit more in one city than you will have to pay in another city. And so keep that in mind that you don't drive yourself crazy about these things. But just to quickly touch on the expat tax, this is something that also really even frustrates me more than tourist traps. Tourist traps, that's one thing. Like, again, you can enjoy, you can have some fun. But the expat tax, man, that's, it really does frustrate me when I do see these things. Like, there is an accountant that seems to be quite popular here in Portugal amongst expats. A very common choice. I personally don't understand why. I've contacted this individual and just before even addressing a question, before even paying attention to anything you say, the first thing in a response email that I got was, oh, okay, sure, be happy to talk to you. It's going to cost X amount for an initial contact session, for a consultation session. I think it was like between 250 and 300 euros, something like this. That is absurd, in my opinion. I've worked in more than a few countries and have worked with more than a few accountants. and. I have never, ever, ever paid for an initial consultation. That is the moment, when, in my opinion at least, that the accountant should be showing you that they understand the system and that they understand what your situation and your needs are, not that, oh, like in this situation with this one accountant that I contacted starting to offer services that I wasn't interested in, actually completely uh, like going in the opposite direction of what I had messaged them about. I had said, okay, I need A, B, C, and D. And they would say, oh yeah, X, Y, and Z. Da, 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 da. I'm like, I'm not interested in X, Y, and Z. I'm interested in A, B, and C because I know that's what I need because I've needed that before. And I know even if the system in a different country is different, that there are certain things that always remain the same. And so I ended up finding an accountant that didn't charge me the initial consult fee. And even if I have continual questions as time goes on, this accountant has remained available to me to be able to contact. There have been a few of you that have asked for recommendations for an accountant. And so far, I am not quite ready to share who I would say to work with and who I would not say to work with just because I would like to go through a year at least to understand if this person is really worth working with or if they're not because I've had situations in the past that I've dealt with accountants that they seem good at the beginning, but then as time goes on, you see they really don't know what they're doing. So I don't want to lead anybody down a path that could lead to a headache. That's why I'm not sharing any information at this moment in time about any accountants that I would say to work with or not to work with. If you come to me and you say, hey, would you work with this person or would you not work with this person? And you come with a specific name. It's probably more easy for me to say that if I wouldn't work with someone, then I would because I really do not want to lead anybody down the wrong road. But really, like working with an accountant, the first interaction, the lead in can and even not just an accountant, but it could be someone who does real estate, it could like a real estate agent or a lawyer or whatever. Okay, granted, there are certain cases where I would say, yeah, if you're seeking advice and purely only advice, that yeah, a consultation fee does make sense. But don't come just leading out of the gate with your consultation fee. Like, let's see if it even makes sense for us to go that far to begin with. The next thing, though, that I want to jump into is about how it's really not even just about Portugal, but about any country that you may go to that you are not a local. You are a visitor, whether that is a long-term visitor or a short-term visitor, uh, a guest in the country, so to speak. And that is even if you are an expat with a visa, you are still a guest in that country. I've seen so many expats do this one as well, as well as tourists, about getting into conversations and just, oh, in my country, we do this. And, oh, it's the best way to do it. It's because we truly understand what X, Y, and Z is. And it's the best way to do it. And that's how it works. And you guys need to do this. It's so slow or it's so this or it's so that because X, Y, or Z. It is so rude to do that. If you truly take issue with how things are done, 
in the place where you are, maybe it's not the right place for you. I know that may sound harsh, but you always have the option to go home. These people are already home, and there are reasons why certain things are done the way that they are. Granted, maybe things aren't always perfect, but things happen the way that they do because that's how the society has come to form itself. Yes, there may be people in that country that want things to change and are trying to have certain things change, but you don't need to be the one coming in and leading that change. You don't need to be that force for change. Again, like say, for example, you go to your friend's house and you see a picture on the wall that you're not such a fan of. It's not necessarily your place to say, hey, you should really take that picture down. It offends me. No, it's your friend's house. That picture brings them enjoyment. Or even if it doesn't bring them enjoyment, they have that picture on the wall for a reason. Maybe they're going to take it down. Maybe they're not. It's not your place to be the one that actually goes and lifts it off the wall. Again, like I mentioned before, respect is one of the things at the end of the day that is such a core point to so many of the things that you probably shouldn't do in another country. This next point, though, it's not so much of a don't do this, but make sure to do this. Uh, when you come to Portugal, make sure that you have some good walking shoes. The cobblestone and as well even the Portuguese tile um, sidewalks here can eat through shoes very quickly. Make sure the shoes that you have like have a pretty decent sole on them. If they have like just a paper thin like single or double leather layer sole, it might not be the best or most enjoyable experience to walk on uh, when you're here. I would say really it is worthwhile having a good pair of shoes, a good pair of sneakers, or even boots. Like I often do end up wearing boots here just because they've got a pretty thick sole on them and they're pretty rugged and ready to go. So even like when you're walking around in a city, I mean just in general in any city, but you don't see so many people wearing flip-flops. Maybe if you're at the beach, then fine, that's a different situation. But wearing any kind of thin shoe is really not going to be so great here. Or Wearing heels. I can't say I know about this one from personal experience, but I have seen people wearing them and breaking ankles or twisting ankles, falling over. It's not a pretty sight, although I have seen a few women that are out there walking in some really high, high heels, spikes that have made their way down the street, but it's almost impressive. But you see just kind of this like going at one foot per minute kind of rate, barely able to get down the street. So I would say maybe leave the heels at home if you are somebody who normally wears them and wear like a, something with a thicker sole, but definitely not a like high spiked heel of some sort. And especially when the tiles like the Portuguese tiles get wet, they can become very, very slippery. So having something with some good grip can also be worthwhile having. The next thing though that I do want to get into is never ever be in a rush. Never try to get a million things done in one day. Yeah, okay, fine, you can try to get as much done as possible, but you have to really be willing to bring a lot of patience with you when you go get certain things done. You may have to wait longer than you originally planned. You may need more time to get something done than you originally planned. Maybe you have to have multiple visits to the place more than what you had planned. Granted, there will be times you will be surprised how fast some things can actually happen here. Uh, like, for example, internet getting that hooked up here in Braga. I've had this experience as well as a number of other people here who have had the experience of getting it hooked up within like a couple of days or the next day. My situation was longer than everybody else who I've spoken to here. I had to wait three days. Maybe <laughs> Everybody else has been less than that. So there will be things that can take some time, that there's always a process, there's always something to do, always a paper. Just, just take your time. Relax. Don't worry about it. You need to bring that patience there with you, like I mentioned before. But even though you shouldn't be in a rush, don't be surprised if when you're here, People may drive like they are in a rush. Maybe there are so many other things that happen during the day that people can't rush through. Maybe driving is the one thing that some people do try to rush through. Um, even, for example, if you get in a taxi or a, sh a car share ride or a bus, even for that matter, 
Don't be surprised if you get a driver that thinks that maybe they should have driven F1 or rally cars instead. I've had a number of those. I've been on some backcountry roads in a bus with a driver who thought they were an F1 driver. <laughs> Just, yeah, don't be surprised about that. Portuguese drivers can really, it's, I'm not going to say they're like Italian drivers, but they sure have some guts. This last point, though, that I want to get into is that maybe even I would say this for a lot of other European destinations, especially like Italy, that if you're going to be staying somewhere, renting a car may not necessarily be the best option. If you're going to be in a major city and you're not planning to go to many other places, public transportation or taxis or Ubers or Bolt, whatever it may be, or even scooters can sometimes be a better option, in my opinion. Finding parking in European cities can be tricky. It can be limited. Or then even having maybe in some places to try to figure out how to use the machine so that you can pay and all of that can be annoying. So I wouldn't necessarily advise it. If you're planning to go to a lot of smaller towns, maybe then it starts to make more sense. But if you are going to be traveling between more major areas, then you probably will have options for trains or buses that will be able to take you where you need to go. I live in Braga and I would say I don't need a car here and having a car could be a bit annoying. If I were living outside of Braga and often driving into the city, maybe, maybe that would make more sense. Um, in the center, they do have some parking garages, some public parking garages that you can pay for, but Overall, as somebody living here day to day, am I not able to maybe go to the supermarket and pack my car, my non-existent car, <laughs> with groceries? Yeah, no, that's not happening. I have to go more often. This is something that I've spoke about in a long time ago in a previous episode, that this is a major difference between living in America versus living in some other parts of the world, where it's very much a part of the culture that like, you go to your supermarket and you just pack your cart completely full, almost to the point that things are falling out, and you go shopping maybe once a month, once every other couple of weeks, every few weeks, and then you have these big giant freezers, but because space is an issue, uh, and also having space to park a car can be an issue, there are a lot of people who will end up going more often to the supermarket every other day, every other few days, and maybe have a cart with them, or just carry what they can in their hands. And that's something that's a little bit more of the norm in some parts of Europe, that you don't go every day, that you don't have this giant pantry and this giant um, freezer, this deep freeze it's the size of a coffin, that you have completely full of everything that you're going to need for the next year. Because people don't have the space for that. I mean, even when it comes to refrigerators, I was looking at an electronics store here the other day, and I just happen to be on the website and I wasn't looking at refrigerators or freezers but my my mouse went over the refrigerators option and I quickly saw and had to mouse back over that they had different classifications for different types of refrigerators and one of the classifications were american fridges because american fridges are kind of known to be a little bit larger than what you may normally find I mean even the the refrigerator in my apartment is quite narrow and tall and it Holds enough, but I would prefer to have something larger, especially the freezer. That's something that definitely lacks space because it's also not that deep. But anyway, I think this is a great place to round out this episode. So, of course, again, thank you all so much for joining for another episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter on this Friday night. And even a bigger thank you to those of you who helped to make this content possible through the monthly support through Patreon, patreon.com slash Rafael Di Furia or rafaeldifuria.com slash Patreon, or the one-time donations through the thanks button here on YouTube, as well as the one-time support through rafaeldifuria.com slash support, as well as the purchases of the shirts, mugs, onesies, and more. Thank you all so very much for being a part of this, as well as a huge, huge thank you to those of you who've been sharing this content and liking it and subscribing it across social media. Thank you all so very much. It really does help the project out. And of course, as always, I'm Rafael Di Furia. Thank you for joining me for another Friday night. And I will see you all next time. Stay safe and healthy out there. Later. Later.